You're listening to ReachMD, the channel for medical professionals. Welcome to Heart Matters, where leading cardiology experts explore the latest trends, technologies, and clinical developments in cardiology practice. Heart Matters is produced in cooperation with the American College of Cardiology. Your host is Dr. Janet Wright, Senior Vice President for Science and Quality for the American College of Cardiology. One of the characteristics of our older patients with heart failure is that they're often plagued with many other medical conditions and are on multiple medications. How can we reduce the risk of adverse drug events among these patients who are battling many diseases at once? Our guest today is Dr. Michael Steinman. He's Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, and the San Francisco VA Medical Center. Welcome, Dr. Steinman. Thank you for having me. I'm very interested in the topic, and I wonder, we should maybe start with a description by you of our, and I'm putting typical in quotation marks, our typical patient with heart failure, someone, let's say, over the age of 75. So your typical patient with heart failure over 75, I think, is best characterized by the fact that there is no typical patient, (laughs) that there's a a tremendous heterogeneity of different types of patients out there. There are a few patients who have relatively isolated heart failure, by which I mean that heart failure is maybe the only major condition that they suffer. But as you alluded to in your introduction, most people with heart failure have a whole host of other conditions that they're grappling with at the same time. That includes other cardiovascular conditions like coronary heart disease or maybe atrial fibrillation, but also a lot of other things that may affect any other number of organ systems. They may have depression. They may have other neurologic disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and on and on. And one of the key challenges with these patients is thinking about how to manage their heart failure care, not only in the context of their heart, but in all the other things that are going on with their body. You describe a patient who, in our current system, not only taking multiple medications for a variety of health problems, but most likely seeing a large number of practitioners. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that characterizes our healthcare systems is that we chop people up into different organ systems, and uh, a bunch of different doctors will be taking care of different parts of that patient. And it runs the risk that we lose the forest for the trees and that the holistic approach to making sure that all of the different organ systems and medications are comporting well with one another, that can sometimes get lost when we're kind of focusing on each of our narrow pieces. I'm very interested, and I know our listeners are as well, in your advice. Given this reality, how can we help treat those complicated patients appropriately, not over or under treat them? I know I'm asking you in a short interview, (laughs) but maybe you could hit the highlights of the types of categories of things that need to be addressed in caring for folks like these. Sure. I mean, I think as anyone who knows who's taking care of patients listening to this interview, it's really hard. And I don't have any sort of simple, easy solutions to address this. But I think there are a few things that we can focus on that can help to sort of crack this nut and provide better care for these patients. I think one of them is just simply being aware of the other conditions that are going on. So for example, for a specialist who might be taking care of the patient, we sort of have a general understanding of what the past medical history might be. But a lot of times the currently updated list of medications can be very hard to track down from one doctor to the next. And working with patients to try to maintain an accurate, up-to-date med list that they can take from doctor to doctor and be updated can help to prevent problems about prescribing one drug that interacts with another drug. Another key role is for the primary care doctor is really the quarterback of this process. It can be difficult for the primary care doctor to feel like the care of their patient is being managed by someone else and that they're only kind of finding out things secondhand. I have this in my own clinic. But I think a key thing is for the primary care physician to not feel like they're playing a subservient role to the specialists, where there really is a two-way street. Cardiologists, for example, might not know more about heart failure care than the primary care doctor, but the primary care doctor in some ways knows the patient better than the cardiologist, at least in certain circumstances. So the primary care doctor really has a role in interfacing with the cardiologist and figuring out what's going to be the best thing for this patient, considering their heart failure but considering everything else that the primary care doctor is dealing with in the same patient. I think that was just beautifully said. In this time of health system reform, we're hopeful there'll be health system reforms. What support can come from the delivery system to service this particular group of patients better? Well, I think having better communication between different physicians is going to be essential, both for the referral process to exchange information back and forth, as well as underlying clinical information, such as the patient's medication list or their laboratories or their medical chart. 
So the emergence of electronic health records in more and more health systems, I think, is a really important tool to help facilitate that. But kind of on the flip side, it's important to say that those electronic health records are a tool, but it all depends on how we use that tool. It's really important that any of these more systems-type interventions be considered not as a solution unto themselves, but as providing an opportunity for us to take advantage of it, but it's not just going to kind of land in our laps without any effort. So some of the other things that can be useful, not only electronic medical records, but other patient-owned medical records, you know, Google has a new kind of electronic health platform. I don't know much about it personally, but I think there's going to be a greater emergence of patients holding on to their own medical records in addition to it just existing in the doctor's office or the hospital system. And that's going to be another thing that we can tap into to really try to improve coordination of care among doctors. Then the final thing I'll talk about is not really a high-tech solution, but it's just a greater emphasis on educating the patient and providing, to use sort of a trite word, but I think it's true, empowering them in their care. You know, a lot of the information that gets communicated from doctor to doctor is relayed through the patient, and the patient is the ultimate receiver of that care. We can talk till we're blue in the face, but if they're not going to take the medicines, anything we prescribe isn't going to help them. So really kind of working with the patient to try to sort of help them help themselves and really be an advocate in this process, which will help care coordination, I think is another essential element. One of the things that will help with that is not only having doctors provide that education, because we have limited time in our clinics. We should try to do it when we can, but it's unrealistic to expect we're going to achieve it all. So working with other people who we work with clinically, nurses, pharmacists, and others, I think it's going to be a really essential element to delegating those responsibilities and not just having it all rely on the shoulders of the doctor. If you're just joining us, you're listening to Heart Matters on ReachMD. It's the channel for medical professionals. I'm your host, Dr. Janet Wright, and our guest today is Dr. Michael Steinman, Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, and the San Francisco VA Medical Center. We're discussing the complexity of medication management in patients of advanced age and those with heart failure. Dr. Steinman, you were talking about the value of team care in folks who are managing multiple diseases and multiple medications. On the patient side of the team are often family members because with advanced age, some of our elderly patients are perfectly capable of managing all their own affairs and others need some additional assistance, uh, caretakers or family members the efforts to educate and empower obviously extend to those individuals as well. Absolutely. I mean, I think including caregivers, whether those be family members, paid caregivers, or sort of other family and friends, can be is really important to making this happen because they really act as, in many cases, the patient's eyes and ears and really are their surrogates for providing effective health care. And they're the ones who often are actually the ones delivering the medicines, so they really need to know about those drugs. I think adherence to medication is tough at any age, and it gets more and more complicated with frequency of dosing and multiple medications. What can you share with our listeners about pearls to improve adherence and to assess adherence? So I think one of the key things is that, you know, as you mentioned, adherence is a huge challenge, but a lot of times it's silent. There's a natural inclination for patients to not tell their doctors that they're not adhering with their medicines because patients understand they want to please us and not basically admit that they're not doing what we've asked them to do. So approaching adherence questions in a non-judgmental tone that implicitly sort of makes the patient think that it's okay to disclose that information is crucial. So the way I personally talk to patients in my clinic about adherence is, you know, asking it, saying, framing it as it can be very hard to remember to take all the medicines or for some reasons or another people don't take their medicines. Is this something that ever happens to you? And sort of framing it as a normative thing that many people do as opposed to a bad thing that patients may be more hesitant to admit. In terms of actually improving adherence, there's been a whole bunch of studies on this. And again, there's no one magic solution. But I think if there's one take-home message to improve adherence, it's minimizing the number of doses of medicines Mm -hmm. that people take. It is much harder for someone to take six medicines if they're spread out in a three or four times a day dosing schedule for them to take 10 medicines if they're all given at the same time of day. So it's not just the total number of medicines that counts, although that does matter. But if you can really reduce the dosing frequency once a day if possible, twice a day at most, that can be really helpful in terms of improving adherence if the question is forgetting, if the non-adherence is due to the patient not being able to afford the medicine 
or the patient just believing that the medicine doesn't work and not wanting to take it or having side effects that they're hesitant about, that's not going to solve that problem. So one of the other things that's critical in assessing adherence is not only figuring out if the patient is or is not taking their drugs, but why they're not taking the drugs. Is it because of forgetting? Is it because of cost? Is it because of side effects? Because then the solution needs to be tailored to whatever problem you uncover. I think it's such an important point that you make. Many of us in a busy office do not routinely ask, are you having any trouble staying on your medicines? Recognizing, as you said, that it's a very common and normal situation, but we might not take the time to ask. And many, many patients would never admit that they're having trouble from a financial standpoint. So trying to make it okay for them to tip the doctor or nurse off to that situation would be very helpful. Exactly. And I think basically to reiterate what I said before, this is a task in terms of assessing adherence, which ideally could be shared with other people in the office and outside the office, you know, nurses, pharmacists, et cetera. So the goal is not just to dump more and more onto the doctor's lap and expect they're going to be able to achieve it all. We do need to be doing a better job as physicians, and that's myself included as a practitioner. I struggle with this every day. But the solution isn't just to take it all into ourselves, but it's to work creatively with the nurses in our office, with pharmacists we work for, either in our medical center, if we work in a medical center, or in a community pharmacy if we're based in the community, to really try to work with those people to sort of have a team approach to assessing adherence. And then once we assess it and find problems, finding ways to improving it. You know, your emphasis on the team, I think, is so critical. In some settings, I've been able to work with a pharmacologist or a pharmacist on rounds or briefly in my office. We couldn't keep it going in in the office for long, but the extraordinary trust that a patient puts in the pharmacist was very helpful, I thought, for reinforcing the need to stay on medication and that we were entering a process together of adjusting the dose over time. Anything to add to that about the role of the pharmacist? No, I I think that's an important point. There have been a number of studies which have shown that having pharmacists involved does help improve the quality of medication care and does improve adherence. The real trick is, you know, finding a way in our current sort of healthcare funding environment to make that work because pharmacists aren't just going to be kind of falling out of the trees into (laughs) into every clinician's offices just asking for work to do. So it's sort of unrealistic to expect that we're going to have a perfect system that's going to emerge overnight. But I think there is enough evidence from the medical literature to suggest that pharmacists really can add value, which is entirely consistent with a lot of our own individual anecdotal experiences. It's definitely worthwhile to try to find a way of teaming up with local pharmacists, however each clinician defines what local means for them, and seeing if there are ways of working together. And it's a process that takes time. It's not going to happen overnight, but I think it's sort of developing these teams and thinking creatively about working together with other people in the office and in the local community that is going to ultimately make the difference. Not going to fix everyone, but it's going to help hopefully take us kind of a step beyond where we are now. If we're able to move to a system that rewards based on outcomes to the extent that they can be measured, paint us a picture of enhanced patient outcomes if we were able, in a more systematic way, to improve medication adherence. Well, I mean, I think there's several outcomes to possibly think of. I mean, so that the most important outcome is whether the patient dies or is hospitalized or other major clinical events from their disease. They're easy to measure but they're hard to impact directly because there's so many other things which impact these factors that are outside of the clinician's control. Or even if they're in our control, it's difficult to change overnight. So as a short term, thinking about process measures, how many of our people are prescribed a certain medicine, for example, the common quality criterion about what percentage of heart failure patients with impaired ejection fraction are on an ACE inhibitor or on an approved heart failure specific beta blocker are definitely useful ways of thinking about it. And there's increasing emphasis on patient satisfaction And my own personal opinion about that, when I first sort of became aware of these measures, I sort of discounted them. I thought, well, you know, patients may be satisfied or unsatisfied, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're getting good or bad quality care. And that is true. Patient satisfaction does not strongly correlated with the actual quality of care they're getting. But what it can give us a hint of, we need patients to be engaged and motivated to engage in these difficult behaviors of taking multiple medicines per day, coming back for frequent laboratory checks, and so on and so forth. We've been talking with Dr. Michael Steinman about the complexity of medication management for the elderly folks with heart failure. Dr. Steinman, thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to Heart Matters on ReachMD, the channel for medical professionals. Heart Matters is produced in cooperation with the American College of Cardiology. For more information on this week's show or to download a podcast of this segment, please visit us at ReachMD.com. 
Thank you for listening.